Hello, and welcome to Ipsy Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm Adel Romero, Assistant Professor of Law at Northern Illinois University College of Law. My guests are Professor Valina Beatty, Professor of Law at Arizona, Uni- Arizona State University Sandra Day O'Connor Con- College of Law, and Jennifer D. Oliva, Associate Professor at Seton Hall University School of Law. And today we're going to be discussing their new paper, Regulating Bite Mark Evidence, Lesbian Vampires and Other Myths of Forensic Odontology, forthcoming in the Washington Law Review. So this is a third in the series, right? Um, We had Discovering Forensic Fraud, which is the first, and Evidence on Fire, Arson-Related Myths. Um, Why are we looking in this paper at lesbian vampires and other myths of forensic odontology, you two? Okay, I'm going to give you the answer to this, Mabel, if you're ready for it. So Professor Beattie represented um, the women that we use as sort of like the case study for our lesbian vampires in this paper. And um, she and I started talking about this case and she started telling me about the bite mark evidence that came in and why they were wrongfully convicted. And I I will note that um, she not only uh, very competently represented them, but they were ultimately um, exonerated. Um, And I was outraged as an evidence professor about this and said that none of this evidence would ever come in in a civil case. Mm -hmm. Uh, And Professor Beatty uh, looked at me and said, well, it most certainly came in and they spent uh, quite some time in prison uh, based on this um, information. So um, that's sort of what provoked us. After we did the first piece, we decided to do sort of case studies, in particular forensic sciences. And we started with arson, which involved another case that she litigated uh, and then this bite mark case. And I'll, I'll let Professor Beattie take it away from there. Yeah, our, our interest in this trilogy has really been there's this faulty or flat out fraudulent forensic evidence that would be challenged in a civil case uh, and would likely be excluded from even coming in. But in criminal cases, it comes in without a challenge. And you have people like Dr. West, who testified in Lee and Tammy's case uh, against them. Uh, testifying about bite marks, which we now know uh, are completely bogus. And I would hesitate to say that about uh, a forensic discipline, because I I would not say that a forensic discipline is completely bogus, except for bite marks uh, that that are being used to, to match a person's dentition to a mark that is on skin. Uh, they don't even have internal validation. When they try and do their own internal studies, they're not able to agree on whether a mark is a bite mark. And then next, whether the bite mark is made by an animal or by a human. So even internally, they're not able to validate their own work. Uh, And to see that kind of bite mark evidence continue to come in in cases uh, is horrifying. Uh, The courts are not responding to this. There has yet to be a single courtroom that has excluded bite mark evidence in a criminal case. And that's what led us to look to administrative regulation as a solution. That's Professor Oliva's area of specialty uh, and looking at administrative law. And there has to be some alternative solution if the criminal courts themselves are not going to stop this bogus evidence from coming in. Fantastic. So um, we'll get to talking about Tammy's case in a little bit and some of those administrative, you know, sorts of solutions that you explore in the, you know, toward the end of the paper and everything. But I want to kind of get down to brass tacks for those of of the listeners who might not be familiar with this. Um, How is it that this sort of stuff is getting admitted in, you know, criminal cases where you've got, you know, jurors who are made up of, you know, just random, normal people who might not have legal training, um, you know, it's getting admitted in those sorts of cases where these jurors are expected to sift through good science and junk science, but then it's not getting admitted in civil cases. Why is there this big difference? Well, I mean, I, to, to add to that, um, you know, forensic ontology does have its place in the law of evidence, and it's place been mm-hmm. since the time of Paul Revere, America's first dentist, um, it was to identify uh, bodies, right, after death or a mass disaster, right? So you actually have the individual, right, the, the body, uh, and we could get their teeth, uh, and we had their actual teeth and their body, and um, those uh, kinds of identifications are fairly uh, statistically significant. It's now evolved and valid. I, just quickly, I mean, that is a valid use of um, of 
forensic odontology is to identify a body by identifying the teeth. That's right. So you're not repudiating the entire field of forensic dentistry or anything like that. And we want to emphasize that. And, and that's sort of been the history here that's gone back a long time. And those IDs are, are quite valid and reliable, as Professor Beattie said. However, um, some folks started to think that what they could do was identify bite marks on human skin. That's highly problematic for a whole bunch of reasons. You don't have a lot of the things that you have um, in um, death and destruction and casualty cases, including whoever the individual is laying there with their actual teeth. Um, what you're trying to do is see is if an imprint on human skin um, can be uh, individuated to one person. And as it turns out, um, that is just proven to be scientifically impossible to date. Nonetheless, what's happened is this stuff got introduced in criminal cases, sort of starting with the People versus Marx case, which is sort of the seminal case on this. Um, once it came in, and that was a very highly unusual case, as we explain, uh, where the, deten the dentition was on a nose. And um, since that time, um, the criminal courts, as they tend to do, and this is a theme that runs through all three papers in our trilogy, simply um, continues to admit it because another court did or take judicial notice of the fact that this should be admissible and doesn't even bother to do a Daubert analysis and it's not challenged by uh, defense attorneys. So what's involved in that Daubert analysis? I mean, that's what you usually see happening in civil cases, right? Some sort of extensive analysis to see, okay, is this good science? Is this junk science? Does it meet a certain standard? Um, and it sounds like that's not happening in these criminal cases. No, there's uh, infrequently uh, or almost never a Daubert challenge, and I'll, I'm going to turn over to P Professor Beattie in a minute, because what provoked the entire trilogy was her explaining this to me. Um, we routinely challenge virtually everything we can in civil law when it involves expert evidence, as you know, in toxic tort cases and products liability cases. We have all of this pretrial vetting of experts, uh, and we go hard. And she said, very rarely is there ever a Daubert hearing, very rarely are those standards ever applied. So I'm going to let her talk about um, what happens in criminal law and why uh, these evidentiary issues are often litigated exclusively on post-conviction and habeas. Right. So generally, there's not as much funding that's available in a criminal case as in a civil case. So you have a criminal defense attorney who uh, asks for funds from the court, may be able to bring in an expert. Uh, but it's not going to be nearly as extensive as in civil cases. And then on the part of the prosecution, the prosecution has uh, witnesses that they go to regularly and who they're used to working with and the court generally accepts. I mean, the courts are seen as punting this to the jury, saying we're going to let this in and then we'll let the jury decide how reliable it is and how much weight to be given to this. And with bite mark evidence in particular, there's this horrible circular uh, continuation of cases where um, actually is West Virginia, uh, our highest court, accepted bite mark evidence and judicial notice of bite mark evidence, which meant it could just automatically come in. Uh, and they, with, with like no question right, at all, just right. like it just, just automatically comes in. comes in. And oh. they based oh, that decision on a wrongful conviction in Wisconsin. At the time, uh, it wasn't known that it was a wrongful conviction, but literally their case that they turned to to say, you know what, this looks valid. We're just going to give judicial notice and accept it every time across the state of West Virginia was a wrongful conviction case. And then you saw courts nationally relying on the West Virginia case to say, well, we'll also take judicial notice. We'll just let it in all the time. So this is like a self-propagating disaster that just keeps spreading throughout exactly. the country. Exactly. And frankly, I don't know that it's going to stop until we are uh, self-policing, either within um, dentistry and among forensic odontologists or prosecutors not bringing in this evidence anymore. So, you know, this junk science, you know, when we're talking about bite mark evidence, it sounds like a disaster in and of itself, but has it been used in proportionate fashion against defendants of all backgrounds or have certain groups been targeted in using this sort of bite mark evidence? So it's been a particular fit for being used against um, sexual minorities. So the LGBTQ community in particular, and we saw, um, that most viscerally, and we highlighted it uh, in our article in a case in West Virginia, which is Lee Stubbs and Tammy Vance, uh, and the, the tropes 
um, the negative stereotypes, uh, connecting violent and vicious uh, lesbians to bite marks, that bite marks are a sign of a homosexual assault. So we've seen this against quote unquote killer lesbians, um, but you also see it against other members of the queer community as well. So I want to get into a bit more detail about um, the Stubbs and Vance case and specifically um, a particular doctor's examination of, uh, you know, their alleged victim, um, Ms. Williams. Um, what exactly happened in this case and what, what was that examination that um, Dr. West did? What was it like? So Lee and Tammy were uh, in a, they were traveling with the victim. They were all traveling together. They stopped at a hotel room. Uh, and the victim at that point overdosed, and Lee and Tammy called the ambulance to come and uh, resuscitate her and, and, and save her, frankly. Uh, and then once the victim was taken to the hospital, um, Dr. West, Dr. Michael West, a dentist from Hattiesburg, Mississippi, um, was called in to come and examine the victim. Uh, so what we see next are a series of videos that Dr. West takes of the victim naked. So he examines while her unconscious. while unconscious. He examines her entire body while she's unconscious in the hospital and she's naked. So, so she can't consent and he's a dentist. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. Oh. And he ends up identifying uh, some uh, a bite mark on the thigh, but then he says that he can tell that half of the victim's labia has been chewed off. So here's this dentist examining her genitalia while she's unconscious. Oh, gosh. So he uh, makes the claim that half of the labia is chewed off. Uh, and Lee and Tammy, their uh, dental molds are taken, and ultimately they are charged with assault and assault of the victim based on his findings. I'm just horrified at just the number of levels of wrong that are going on here. Um, yeah. you know, even apart from, you know, this non-consenting um, person getting examined by a dentist who obviously has no business examining an entire body, but him somehow relying on his expertise as a dentist to say that he knows what genitalia should look like and, mm -hmm. you know, what this sort of injury, supposed injury would look like. It seems like there are a lot of problems here. How does this get accepted at a trial? I don't, it, it's hard to grasp. I, I almost don't understand given how um, incongruous it seems. Yeah. And the, def the defense tried to bring up, there was no blood, like there's no sign here of any type of injury. Uh, and yet his testimony was able to come in. Um, Professor Levo, were you going to say something? Yeah, I mean, it's worse than that. It's not only that the evidence came in and he was allowed to uh, testify. They had, uh, you know, uh, uh, experts testify for the prosecution, uh, opining on their sex, these two women's sexuality. Uh, they brought in this sort of uh, discriminatory evidence about that, talking about uh, v how violent uh, uh, quote unquote lesbian assaults are. Uh, that's, you know, trying to tie this to the labia. And uh, Professor Beatty's app and the prosecutor relies heavily on this in closing. And, um, you know, there's no question that expert testimony was put on by the defense saying if, if a labia was bitten and torn, there would have been blood everywhere. This is how this works. And there's no evidence that any of this could have ever happened or there was any abnormality or asymmetry um, that, that's material or that would lead us to believe that anything else here occurred with the labia. But that was completely um, irrelevant. So you think about we've got this really, really faulty evidence uh, of bite marks with this dentist sitting here. And at the time that Dr. West testified, by the way, he'd been under ethics investigation investigations, you know, had his membership threatened to be suspended or suspended in various organizations. He had, his opinion had um, been the basis of numerous wrongful convictions already that had been overturned. And he was allowed, nonetheless, a certified witness to get on the stand and testify to these facts. And then he and yet another expert testified that, um, you know, they were even more certain uh, about what had occurred here because uh, they presumed uh, based on some testimony uh, that, that folks had seen the, uh, the defendants kissing in the past, that they were lesbians, and therefore this is necessarily what must have happened. And the jury, of course, ran with that. 
Well, to circle it back to how we may think this sounds absolutely ridiculous, but when we couple it with this allegation that this is particular to the LGBTQ community, right, and that um, really mm -hmm. uh, placing it on an othered community, I think that's what led a jury to be able to say, well, I've never heard of anything like this, but I don't know, maybe because this is a homosexual assault. I mean, some of the testimony uh, I mean, the prosecutor himself says the bite marks are important in closing because it indicates a homosexual assault. It indicates yeah. a sexual assault. Uh, and then you have, um, sadly, the defense called <clears throat> uh, expert witness who himself said that, yes, quote unquote, homosexual crimes are very sadistic. More violent yeah. crimes I've seen in my experience are homosexual to homosexual. They do what we call overkill. They do tremendous damage. They're more gory, the more repulsive crimes I've ever crimes I've ever seen were homosexual to homosexual. So there's a whole nother level to it. And you know, I was really shocked reading the testimony that you excerpted in the paper, um, talking about quote unquote lesbian rape type situations and this presumption that the more brutal the assault, the more likely it was committed by someone who's homosexual. Um, and, you know, that made me wonder, um, are lesbians, for example, more likely to be convicted of crimes generally than hetero women? Is that something that, you know, a disparity that exists across the board? You know, we actually don't have enough information on that. We do know that uh, queer youth, LGBTQ youth, are more likely to be incarcerated and in juvenile facilities. Um, but I don't think we have enough information uh, and research on uh, the disparity between prosecutions and convictions of adults in the queer community versus uh, straight community. Oh, interesting. Um, so I want to talk a little bit. Oh, sorry. There is, however, I was just going to add, there is no empirical evidence whatsoever that homosexuals actually commit more crimes in the general population or are more, or more violent crimes. That we do know. I mean, these are really bizarre myths, you know, that I appreciate you getting into these too. Um, so I imagine at least at trial counsel, uh, trial defense counsel challenged whether the bite mark evidence was generally accepted within the scientific community, right? I mean, I hope that he did at least that. So defense counsel tried to challenge the bite mark evidence, tried to challenge Dr. West on all the points that Professor Oliva made, uh, that he shouldn't be on the stand as an expert at all. Uh, and also tried to challenge Dr. West's testimony about video evidence. Uh, he also got on the stand and testified about video evidence. Uh, Dr. West, in other cases, would testify to blood splatter. Um, and yet, despite, yeah, despite those, any oppositions, he still was able to proceed with his testimony. I thought that Dr. West had a really interesting response with regard to um, the validity of bite mark evidence. He said that it was um, half art and half science. <laughs> is that right? Something like that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, which is similar to what we um, talked about in our fire science article, uh, Evidence on Fire, that in the 1990s that uh, fire investigators would say, oh, um, I listen to the fire. I listen to what it tells me. It's really an art. You have to understand what the fire is saying. Uh, and there's just no empirical evidence for that uh, and no verifiability at all. And that's exactly what Dr. West would stay on the sand about identifying bite marks. I mean, it seems like exactly what you don't want to have if it's supposedly, you know, sci scientifically valid, right? Well, that, that's a good point. And that's to my point in civil cases, when um, Professor Beatty started telling me about this stuff, I mean, it was flabbergasting because my experience in fire science is in product liability cases like dryer fires, right? And I thought, there's nobody that we're going to put a thermodynamics expert on the stand, a physicist, a chemist, right, et cetera, and no one's going to be allowed to testify. They'd be Their testimony would be struck immediately. They'd never be qualified as a witness to say, I listened to what the fire, the dryer fire told me in this products liability case, right, against GE or whoever. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, the has these cases where people's lives and liberty on the line, and someone's allowed to come in there with this hocus pocus and um, get these folks convicted. I mean, it's really egregious. I mean, let, yeah, so let's listen to what the dryer fire is telling us. Right. Does sound 
absolutely terrible. And that just doesn't, that doesn't fly in any sort of big civil case at all. I would think that, you know, Daubert sounds like it's actually changed things in the realm of things like toxic tort, products liability, and other civil th things like that, um, as well it should. Yeah. And I mean, some people will have made a very persuasive arguments that the only difference that Daubert's made is in civil cases and that it's been bent the arc of justice towards defendants because the standard is such a, so high to get evidence on the plaintiff's side. Um, so we've we've got this huge, the, the federal rules of evidence are transubstantive. Galbert applies in all cases in federal court and most of the states, uh, over 40 of the states. And um, unfortunately, it is dramatically applied differently depending on whether it's a civil or criminal matter. And there is no legal basis for that. So I have, you know, it sounds like, the, you know, of course there's no legal basis for that. It should be applying across the board. Um, equally in, you know, in criminal and civil cases, that's, you know, and you don't see that happening at the federal level. Have, have states tried to do anything to alleviate this discrepancy at all in, you know, challenges of, you know, in reliability of scientific evidence and the like? Um, have they tried anything innovative? Well, one innovative solution, which has come post-conviction, uh, is to um, have what's uh, colloquially known as a junk science writ, but a um, change science writ. And mm -hmm. this is important in post-conviction because uh, as much as Dr. West was accepted for his testimony on bite marks um, about, uh, this would have been almost 20 years ago uh, with this case, um, he, he's not accepted anymore. So enough time has passed, enough has been learned about bite mark evidence and the unreliability of the field in general that uh, a defendant could actually challenge their conviction and say, my conviction was based on this faulty, fraudulent information. Uh, so it's important to have that kind of a mechanism for relief that can come 10 years later, 20 years later, based on newly uh, discovered evidence of scientific change. I mean, that's great that we have these new mechanisms to you know, address these issues, but these are only available post-conviction, right? Right, exactly. Exactly. I mean, so I I always advocate for public defenders to um, ask for Daubert hearings and to challenge the experts. And I think there has been more of a push for defense counsel to to do that. But we also need prosecutors to be looking more closely at their own experts and their own witnesses and whether that evidence is valid and reliable or is just being created in order to support the the charge. Absolutely. So this is the part of the paper that I'm really, really excited about in that you two propose some solutions just completely outside of, you know, post-conviction relief and completely outside of even just the courts themselves. Um, you propose several really interesting solutions when it comes to bite mark identification regulation. So I would love for you to, to just be able to talk about the, these different ideas that you have and how we might go about implementing them. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think if you can imagine after the first two pieces, the first one we sort of looked at open discovery and some, you know, leveling the, the um, uh, rules of civil procedure and the rules of criminal procedure to help here with these evidentiary issues. And the second piece, we, um, you know, sort of uh, begged the courts to start applying Daubert correctly in criminal cases that involve arson evidence and to hold these experts to the same standards they did in civil cases and sort of tried to invoke some, some shaming. And we talked about also how to make um, using linear sequential unmasking and other techniques to make the criminal system less biased and the evidence more reliable. And I think that by the last piece, Sarah, at least I'll speak for myself, we sort of thought we better start looking extrajudicially at solutions because um, it just doesn't see, people have been writing about this for a long time and it seems like it's being heard. And it was lucky for me because these are prof dentists are professional licensees and I'm a healthcare lawyer and I thought, well, we've got all kinds of solutions with how we deal with misconduct for professional licensees, right? So one of the things that we ended up proposing in this paper that I'll talk about and then we'll let Professor Beatty talk about the, the boards that oversee this on the national level is state boards of dental practice exist in every jurisdiction in the United States and they're responsible for the ethical and standard of care conduct of their licensees. So all of the forensic odontologists that are testifying, including Dr. West, are licensed dentists. And they spend most of their time practicing regular old, you know, shooting up with Novocaine, right, and pulling your teeth and doing caps. And the bottom line at the end of the day is that the states do have jurisdiction over them. 
and taking a lesson from the other professional licensing boards, um, medicine in particular, and we gave some examples, um, you know, they can regulate the test, the ethical testimony of their licensees. And if you look at uh, what the American Dental Association says and what the boards say in their broad enabling language and their statutes, they have the authority to regulate this and um, discipline for, uh, dentists for presenting testimony that is scientifically unreliable. Um, that is That does not fall within the scope of ethical under their professional licensing regulations that these boards control. So one of the things in the paper was uh, uh, board, board pack to start writing um, this sort of um, testimony and conduct and holding their license accountable. I, yeah, that's you know I, I learned a lot about the you know the different organizations that are you know really charged with looking over forensic odontologists. I didn't even know that these boards existed, um, like the American Board of Forensic Odontologists and and the like, um, the American Academy of Forensic Science. Um, have they not really done much of anything thus far to control stuff like that? I mean, I'm surprised that it sounds like there just aren't much in the way of standards yet. Right. So this is part of the reason that um, Professor Olivo is looking at dental boards is because the ABFO, the um, American Board of Forensic Odontology, is not self-policing. And in fact, they're pushing back on any criticism of bite mark evidence. So when the Texas Forensic Science Commission um, was doing a report on the validity of bite mark evidence. Uh, ABFO members actually represented to the commission that if there was a moratorium on bite mark comparison, that that would quote unquote hurt children. According to the ABFO, bite mark victims are frequently very young. Uh, so they're really, they've gone out of their way um, to push back on criticisms of bite mark evidence. Uh, Sadly, the mother organization, um, the AAFS, Forensic Sciences, has continued to um, validate the ABFO organization. So they've continued to have them be a member organization uh, of the American Association of Forensic Sciences, uh, even though there's been tremendous um, undermining that uh, bite marks should even be considered uh, a forensic discipline to be included in uh, the American Association of Forensic Sciences. Well, I was just going to say, and in the same vein of, in the theme of it just gets worse, uh, and not only have they not, have these organizations not sort of um, tighten the belt uh, on the reliability and, vo and validity of um, bite mark evidence, they've actually uh, have a bit of a track record here of uh, bringing ethics complaints and punishing and uh, folks who are uh, um, critics. Uh, so scientists and dentists that have criticized them have been <laughs> far more subject, right, to their disciplinary procedures and secret ethics hearings to smear these folks who have spoken out against um, the bite mark evidence uh, with uh, scientific studies to support them, um, then they have to uh, actually regulate their own uh, field. So again, the story, unfortunately, um, is, is worse than doing nothing. They've been proactive in attacking critics. Wow. They sound incredibly punitive and self-serving and, you know, just completely unreliable when it comes to actually setting any standards, if not, like you just said, um, worse than just neutral, just like incredibly negative. Um, so, yeah, that is a, a great suggestion that you have. State boards of dental practice do your job, right? Yeah, and they, they've been shutting down people who used to be members of the ABFO and then like Dr. Michael Bowers, who um, then started to criticize it and he had ethics complaints filed against him. The Bushes, um, Peter and Mary Bush, who are um, both uh, professors and dentists and did research uh, on whether they could recreate what a bite mark would look like uh, from the same mold on different skin, right? Because that could create reliability for their field. And when it didn't, they were also um, given tremendous pushback for their work. Yeah, most recently, Dr. Game Pretty, we don't know all the details about um, the issues and what's gone on with him because they're confidential, which we complain about in the paper. Um, but he provided key testimony to the Texas Commission that investigated the David Chase case and, um, you know, was anti-bite mark reliability. And again, then we see an ethics complaint and activities directed against him. So this has been an ongoing pattern. It's not a one-off situation. 
Well, I want to return to um, Tammy's case real quick and, um, and Dr. Michael West. Um, does he still advocate for bite mark evidence at all? Does he still believe in this even? He does not. Uh, so in post-conviction, so we got uh, Lee and Tammy's case. Uh, they had been incarcerated for a number of years, and they ultimately were exonerated after 10 years in prison. So they served 10 years. Uh, but in the course of post-conviction work, um, we were able to depose uh, Dr. West and do a deposition, which again is not something that's generally available in criminal trials. So in post conviction, we were able to do this. And he, um, you know, very cavalierly said, well, just let him go. Just let him go. I don't believe in this evidence anymore. I don't believe that bite mark evidence is reliable anymore. So just let him out. And of course, it's not that sadly. Yeah, it's not that easy. And it would have been nice had he realized that, you know, some years prior, right? Um, wow, that's incredible. Um, but happily, um, they were able to get out and they've been released, right? Yes, yes. And they've both been able to to move on with their lives and put this behind them, um, which uh, is hopefully a, an option available for other people who have been wrongfully convicted with bite mark evidence as well, because this evidence has been admitted in court nationally. As I said before, there's still not a single court that has denied admissibility of bite mark evidence at a criminal trial. And that's why I love this paper so much, just looking at other solutions, even you know, extrajudicially, trying to see what we can import from the civil system into the criminal, and looking at what exactly we can do with regard to outside you know, governing boards and the like to try to figure out how to avoid these problems. Um, not post-conviction, but you know, getting these sorts of cases charged and this sort of evidence used in the first place. This is fantastic work you do. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you both for joining me today. I, I appreciate it. And everyone should go and read this one. You know, it's up on SSRN, I believe, right? Um, yeah. But, you know, you're going to see the final coming out very shortly, I believe, right? Yes. Fan. It's going to be It's in the actual December issue of the Washington Law, December 2019 issue of the Washington Law Review, which should be up online um, anytime soon. So that's absolutely right. But we have the pub proof. Uh, up on SSRN and uh, would love to hear folks uh, feedback. Fantastic. Well, thank you both for joining me. Um, look, looking forward to seeing what comes of this and reading more of your work in future. Thank you, Maybell.